night in which our Lord Jesus passed over from death to life, we are gathered here in vigilant prayer. This is the Passover of the Lord in which by hearing his word and celebrating his sacraments, we share his victory over death. Let us pray. O oh God, you are like a refiner's fire and your spirit enkindles the hearts of your faithful people with the fire of your love. Bless, we implore you, this new flame and those who keep this joyful Easter festival that burning with the desire for life with you, we may be found rightly prepared to share in the feast of light, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. His time and eternity are His. His are glory and dominion, now and forever. And by His wounds, we are healed. By the wounds of Christ, we are healed. And by the wounds of Christ, we are healed. May the light of Christ, who has risen in glory from the dead, scatter all the darkness of our hearts and our minds. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, pour out on us your abundant blessings that all who in true faith share this night in joyful celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead may be filled with your heavenly benediction. Once we were in darkness, but now we are in the light, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. The light of Christ. The light of Christ.
light of Christ. Rejoice now, all ye heavenly choirs of angels. Rejoice now, all creation. Break forth the trumpets of salvation and proclaim the triumph of our King. Rejoice, all, all the earth. In the radiance of the light now poured upon you, and made brilliant by the brightness of the everlasting King, know that the ancient darkness has been forever banished. Rejoice, O Church of Christ, clothed in the brightness of this night, let all this house ring out with rejoicing and the praises of all God's faithful people. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places with all our heart and mind and voice praise you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. For he was the very Paschal Lamb, who has offered himself for the sin of the world, who has cleansed the shedding of his precious blood. This is the night when you brought our fathers, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt and led them through the Red Sea on dry ground. This is the night when all who believe in Christ are delivered from bondage to sin and are restored to life and immortality. This is the night when Christ the life arose from the dead. The seal of the grave is broken and the morning of a new creation breaks forth. Oh, how wonderful and beyond all telling is your mercy toward us, O oh God that to redeem a slave you gave to your son. How holy is this night when all wickedness is put to flight and sin is washed away. How holy is this night when innocence is restored to the fallen and joy is given to those downcast. How blessed is this night when man is reconciled to God in Christ. Holy Father, accept now the evening sacrifices of our thanksgiving and praise. Let Christ, the true light and morning star, shine in our hearts. He who gives light to all creation, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forevermore.
resurrection. What's that? Hey. Lord is risen, the victory. Let hearts and birds from evil that we may see our right. The Lord and raise eternal of resurrection light, and listening to his accents, The Old Testament lesson for this Holy Saturday is written in the sixth chapter of Daniel, beginning at the first verse. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over the th over them three presidents of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above the other presidents and satraps because of an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against David, or Daniel, with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of the Lord God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and the assign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said to the king concerning the injunction, O oh, king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any God or man within 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, 
The thing stands fast according to the law of Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction you have signed, but makes petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the, that the law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes may be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's. And nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him. And slept, sleep fled from him. Then at daybreak the king arose and, and went in haste to the den of lions. And as he came near the den, Daniel was. He cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O oh, king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives, and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. For thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Epistle lesson is written in the third chapter, St. Peter's first epistle, beginning at the 17th verse. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for suffer, than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected unto him. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. The Holy Gospel is written in the 27th chapter of St. Matthew, beginning at the 57th verse. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. And he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and he wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut from the living rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Lord, we remember how the impostor said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell people he has risen from the dead. 
and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go and make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Sing to God our gladness, sing to God our hymn. He that on the cross for the world's salvation bled. Jesus Christ, the King, glory now is risen from the dead. Hallelujah, Christ is risen, death at last has met defeat. See the ancient powers of evil in confusion and retreat. Once he died, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On the day of his Moscow arrest, on February 12, 1974, Nobel laureate Alexander Solzhenitsyn published what would be his final message to the Russian people before he was exiled to the West. In the title of the exhortation, he urged the Russian people to Live not by lies. What did he mean by live by, live not by lies? Or live by lies. He meant, Schultz and Eason wrote, accepting without protest all the falsehoods and propaganda that the state compels its citizens to affirm, or at least not oppose, to get peaceably along under totalitarianism. Everybody says that that they have no choice but to conform, says Schultz and Eason, to accept powerlessness. But that is a lie that gives all the other lies their malign force. The ordinary man may not be able to overturn the kingdom of lies, but he can at least say that he is not going to be its loyal subject. We are not called upon to step out into the square and shout out the truth. Or to say loudly that what we think, that's scary, says Schultz and Eason. We are not ready, he says, but at least we can refuse to say we do not think. For example, Schultz and Eason says 
that if a, if a person refuses to live by lies, that they will not say, write, or affirm, or distribute anything that distorts the truth. They will not go on a demonstration or participate in a collective action unless he truly or she truly believes in the cause. They will not take part in a meeting in which the discussion is forced and no one can speak the truth. They will not vote for a candidate or a proposal that co coincides and they consider to be dishonest or untrustworthy. They will walk out of an event as soon as they hear the speaker utter a lie, an ideological drivel, or some shameless propaganda. And they will not support journalism that distorts or hides the underlying facts. This is by no means an exhaustive list, right, Schultz and Eatson, of all the possible and necessary ways of avoiding lies, but it is a start. It is a start. So, today, you who are to be confirmed have a start. This is a start, right? And you three, especially, but really everybody else here in this room, have to ask ourselves every day, are we going to live by lies? Are we going to enable them? You know, they refused. To live our lives. One of the readings for today, if we did the uh, non-communion service, is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's one of the stories for today. Some of you are familiar with it. Shadrach and Meshach, Abednego, they were the ones that worked for the previous regime, the one before the Persians, the ones that Daniel gets, got, gets sideways with the Persians, as you heard in the Old Testament lesson. But the, the regime that, that preceded them were the Babylonians. And the king of the Babylonians was a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar thought it was a good idea to set up a massive gold statue. And, and any time the band played, there was a special band with a bunch of instruments. And any time they played, you were, you were immediately stop what you're doing and pray and, and, and worship that golden statue. Massive statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Hebrews. Right? And they weren't going to do it. And so they were arrested. Even though they were part of the government, they were working... They were literally working for the government, and they refused to do it. They were arrested, and Nebuchadnezzar, who was an absolute monarch, and was the leader of the, the most important empire in the middle, at least the, 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 you know, the Western world. He said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you did not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I had set up? If you do not worship, you shall be cast into the midst of a burning furnace. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God will save us and deliver us from the burning furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if he does not, let it be known, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image that you have set up. Right? So basically, God will deliver me if he wants to, he wants to deliver us. And if he doesn't deliver us, we're still going to burn, but we, we're not going to serve your false gods. No. Nope. Not happening. They didn't want to live by lies. And what happened? They were thrown into the fiery furnace. And did they die? They should have, right? The, the three guys that opened up the furnace to throw them in, to break a hole in the furnace, to get them to come in, to throw them into the furnace, they were tied up too. They were bound, thrown in the furnace like wood. Those, those guys were killed by the, by, the, by the heat coming out. That's how severe it was. And yet when they were thrown into the furnace, nothing happened to them. In fact, all of a sudden they were no longer bound. Somebody had untied them inside the furnace and there was a fourth person there, it says in the book of Daniel, that was with them and it looked, his appearance was like that of the Son of God. In other words, the pre-incarnate Christ appeared in the fiery furnace with them and not so much as their clothing was singed. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And then today's Old Testament lesson, right, 
Daniel. So, you know, the, the, the Persians overthrow the Babylonians, right? They take over their empire. And they're better. They're a better group of people. They're more respectful of Israel, and they're, they're kinder, and they're gentler, and not as barbaric. But, you know, Daniel is too successful, and he's basically, like I said, a president. He's basically like a prime minister of the empire, and he's, and he's going to be promoted to, to, for sure, like the chief of staff. And so all the other satraps and all the other presidents, they conspire against him because they know he's a pious guy. They know he, 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 you know, has, he, he prays three times a day to the Lord God on his, on his roof. And so they set him up and he get him arrested. And he's guilty of breaking this law of the Medes and Persians, right? That for 30 days, no one can petition a god or man except the king. And again, he is thrown into the lion's den, right? Because the king is trapped. The king arose very early in the morning and went out in haste to the den of lions. Where Daniel had been thrown the night before and sealed in. And he cried out lamenting. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you continually serve, delivered you from the lions? Because Darius, the king, really did care about Daniel. He admired him and liked him a lot. They were friends. And Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found to be innocent before him. And, O king, you as well. I have done nothing wrong before you. Again, Daniel refused to live by lies. Refused. He refused to live by lies. And then that brings us to today's gospel lesson, the, the lesson of Joseph of Arimathea, right? You know, Joseph of Arimathea is an interesting guy. He, he just appears out of nowhere. You never hear from him again, never know anything about him again. He just kind of appears and disappears. But what's interesting about Joseph of Arimathea is that he will not live by lies. And even though he's a disciple of Jesus, even though he has nothing to gain at this point, I mean, Jesus is literally dead, right? I mean, they're taking him off the cross and wrap, you know, wrapping him up. Right? The Romans have possession of the body at this point. And he goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. And Pilate gives him the body. And then he wraps it in fine linen which is a, a type of textile that we don't even know how to make anymore. It, it, it stopped being made around 50, on a year, 50 AD. And we don't even know how to make it. It's, made, it's like, like wo woven with silver and gold and, and, and other things. It's just we don't even know how to do it. The Egyptians did it. We don't know how to do it. He wrapped him up in that. And he laid him in his own clean, fresh new tomb that he'd been you know, cr creating for when he died. Right? And when he did this, it's really interesting because the, what's, what's interesting about this is several, there's several points that are worth noting about what he did. First thing he wrote he, is he painted a massive target on his forehead. Because the sense is that before he appears, no one really knows he's a disciple. He's kind of like, he's kind of below the, he's below most people's radar that he's a, that he's a believer. And by, by getting the body of Jesus and burying him the way he did, because most people that were crucified, they just threw them on the garbage heap. That's what the Gehenna was called outside Jerusalem, was the garbage heap. They just threw those bodies out there. And so by treating Jesus' body the way they did, this is a massive rebuke to the authorities of Jerusalem who, who manipulated to get Jesus crucified. And this makes him an enemy of the state, an enemy of the people that kind of run things. And this is not a small threat to his life. We know that as soon as the, the ascension of Jesus into heaven occurs, already the Jewish authorities that oppose Jesus and his disciples are rounding up believers and having them killed. We know this because a man named Saul of Tarsus oversaw the execution of St. Stephen, the proto-martyr. And Saul of Tarsus later, after his conversion, went by the name of St. Paul, or Paul. Secondly, by doing, by getting Jesus' body and treating it the way he did, what Joseph of Arimathea is doing is he's confessing that Jesus isn't guilty of the crimes he was executed for. And therefore, he merits a good, honorable, and decent funeral. And thirdly, 
Joseph is refusing to live by the lies that were leveled against Jesus. When they said he was something he was not supposed to be, right? Remember that liar, that deceiver, they said in our gospel lesson. Joseph, by doing what he did, is showing us that Jesus is not a liar. He's not a deceiver. And Joseph is willing to put literally his own line, his own life on the line to put, to, to, to defend that position that Jesus spoke the truth. With no resurrection yet. Right? With no indication that he is gaining anything by doing this. He only is putting himself at risk with no hope yet of reward. Now, why do I talk about this tonight? Because you who are compromands are going to have to make a choice, maybe many times in your life. But you're going to have to choose whether you're going to live by lies or whether you're going to maintain your integrity. And only you can make that decision. Only you can make that choice. Your parents can't make it for you. Your spouses can't make it for you. Kids can't make it for you. Your clergy, your pastors can't make it for you. You have to make it. Will you live like Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Will you emulate and follow the example of Daniel? Will you show the courage of Joseph of Arimathea? Or will you not? Because everybody is tested. Everybody's trial will eventually come. What form it will take, I don't know. When it happens, I don't know. God only knows. But you need to think about it before it happens. Because when the, the storm is upon you, it's too late most times. So... In the name of Jesus Christ, let us not live by lies. Amen. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence, not thy holy. Restore unto me the joy of thy Spirit. Amen. Nice. 
ask the catechumens to come forward. Beloved in the Lord, in the Holy Scriptures, the Lord admonishes us to do all things decently and in good order. To that end, the Constitution and bylaws of this congregation establish how confirmation is to be, take place. And therefore, beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus has said to his apostles, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to observe all things where I have commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You are baptized and catechized in the Christian faith according to our Lord's bidding. Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who art in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who art in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace, and joyfully give an answer to what I will now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you, this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave to you in your baptism? Do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce all his works? Do you renounce all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? Do you confess the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from Holy Scripture to be faithful and true? Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Yes, I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God in faith, word, and deed, and to remain true to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even unto death? Yes, I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession in church, and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Yes, I do, by the grace of God. We rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized and have received the teachings of the Lord. You have confessed the faith and been absolved of your sins. As you continue to hear the Lord's word, receive his blessed sacrament. He has begun a good work in you. See it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mary Page, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you a new birth of water in the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace unto life everlasting. And your confirmation verse is from Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Charlotte Tryon, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you a new birth 
with water and the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your strength, sins, strengthening you in His grace unto life everlasting. Your confirmation verse is, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, in, in needs and in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for whom, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Kevin, Kevin Cornmare, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you a new birth of water in the Spirit and forgiven you all your sins, strengthened you with His grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Kevin, your confirmation verse is from 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But, but sanctify the Lord your God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness and bring these sons and daughters to the knowledge of your Son, um, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and enable them to both hear the word in their heart and to believe with their mouth so as to confess thy saving name. Grant that, bringing forth the fruits of faith, that they may continue steadfast and victorious to the day when, when, they, when they have fought the good fight of faith and shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Let us pray. The Almighty and merciful Lord and Father, who in the waters of holy baptism you have united your children in the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, cleansing them by his blood, renew in them the gift of your Holy Spirit, that they may live in daily contrition and repentance and with the faith that ever clings to their Savior, Deliver them from the power of Satan and preserve them from the false and dangerous doctrines that they may remain faithful in the hearing of Christ's word and the receiving of his body and blood. And by the Lord's Supper, strengthen them to believe that no one can make satisfaction for the sin, but their sins but Christ alone. Enable them to find joy and comfort only in him, learning from this sacrament that you love um, that and your love to love their neighbor as they love themselves and to bear their crosses with patience and joy until the day of the resurrection of their bodies to life and mortality. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. So um, what we'll do is the first communion, the first table for communion, I would invite uh, the, the parents and or sponsors of each catechumen to join them for communion, okay? Just the moms and dads or sponsors uh, or spouses, um, okay? Very good. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the peace that is from above. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We will love as you love. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. 